You nailed that timing. Yeah. <laughs> It's got a note, you know, when you, when you get it right, you get it right. So uh, if you're new to Shrub Church, I'm Justin. I'm the executive pastor here. And today I have the privilege of continuing in our sermon series through Genesis. I just want to let you know right now, buckle up, uh, because I have about 40 verses that I'm preaching on today. Pastor Ryan and I talked, and so I'm basically just going to talk about the flood in totality today. Uh, before I dive in, though, some of you might notice people have been asking me um, some marks on my arm. I had a guy ask me if I lost a fight with a cougar. I laugh because we all know the Cougs don't win. Um, but, um, amen, there we go. But no, I actually, I actually lost a fight with an oven um, trying to turn a pizza. I was too lazy to pull the rack out, and I just stuck my arm in and got it. But the nice thing is when it's that hot, it just kind of cauterizes it, and you're done right away. <laughs> so, um, so yes, no, no fights with animals. And in an honest note, if I did fight a cougar, if I left with just this scratch, I'd feel like I still won, personally. Um, but I have the privilege of continuing in our sermon series through Genesis. And last week, Pastor Ryan shared that God gave grace in a time where he looked all over the earth and he said that the, all the intentions of the thoughts of man were evil continually all the time. That's some pretty intense language. God looked down and saw that his creation because sin had entered it, was destroyed. It was ruined. And so God decided that he was going to do something about it. He was going to judge the sin in the world. And it said that he looked down and he found Noah. He gave Noah favor or grace. He basically chose a sinful man to give him an opportunity to trust him. And he asked Noah to trust him. And Noah said, I will, and, I'll, and begin building the ark, this gift of grace. And the passage that we're going to talk about today, I think oftentimes... Um, we're tempted to think God had grace for few and judgment for many. Noah and his family are saved in the ark, but God kills everyone else. And so we think God, this evil or mean God or angry God, but the reality is God had grace for many, but few chose to receive it. And as we're going to see today, we're going to see that Noah had time to preach. He had time to teach. He had time to model um, obedience to God before the people of the land, and yet they still chose not to get in the boat. The reality is grace was for many, but few chose to respond. And today, we're going to have moments. This is going to be an interesting message because we're talking about the judgment of God. And so it's not like a light topic. It's not just a funny topic, but it is a, a real and it's an important and foundational topic, I think, in our faith. Let's pray, and we'll dive into the beginning of our text. Lord God, I thank you today. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would speak through me, that you'd speak to me, that you would equip your church to trust you and to follow you and to walk with you. Lord, I pray that as we read this text, as we dive into your word, that you would open our eyes to just how good you really are and how great your grace is, how big of a gift it really is. We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. We start off with this first section here in Genesis. The Lord said to Noah, go into the ark, you and all your household. For I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. You've trusted me. You've given me your faith. Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals. They're going to end up as sacrifices later. Of all clean animals, the male, sorry, shh, all clean animals, the male and his mate, and the pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and his mate. And seven pairs of the birds of the heavens also, male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For in seven days I will send rain on the earth, 40 days and 40 nights, and every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. Notice that God says, all the things that I created I will blot out from the land. Oftentimes we think, man, how mean of God, how wrong of God. But again, the creator gets to decide what he does with his creation. And I think about this, you know, blotting out humanity isn't quite the, <clears throat> quite the same as me gardening. But when I garden and I don't like one of my plants, I don't like how things are going, I blot it out. I remove it. I start over. I recreate what I'm doing. But Noah listened to God. He did all that he commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the flood of waters came upon the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him went into the ark to escape the waters of the flood of clean animals and animals that are not clean, and of birds and of everything that creeps on the ground. Two by two, male and female, went into the ark with Noah, as God had commanded. Noah, and after seven days, the waters of the flood came upon the earth. So what do we see here right out of the gate? We see that Noah remained faithful and did all that the Lord asked. 
it's interesting because I think so often in our lives, we think about how we start things, but we rarely think about how we finish. And it often, and what we see in scripture is Paul saying, like, run the race, finish well, focus, live your life in a way that how you finish matters. Noah started the ark, but we also see that Noah completed the ark, that he finished building the boat, that he gathered the animals. And again, Pastor Ryan talked about this last week. We don't believe that Noah went and physically grabbed every animal and drugged them in the boat, but that God brought them to him, brought him to as was his plan. He remained faithful in the Lord. He finished well. Hebrews 7, 11, 7 says, By faith Noah, being warned by God concerning the events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world, and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Noah trusted God. An interesting thing we see is that Noah's faith actually condemned the world. The ark was finished. The floods came. Life, we'll see, was blotted out on the earth, aside from the remnant. But later, we see another person come, Jesus. And Jesus says, I didn't come to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved. But again, the avenue is going to be similar. Jesus is saying, put your faith and your trust in me. Believe in what I say I will do. Finishing matters, friends. Again, so often we focus on how we start, but how we finish matters. You know, I have track on the brain right now because Pastor Ryan's son uh, just ran yesterday and is going to state uh, in the hurdles. And so he PR'd and, and crushed it. And, and it gets me thinking about track because in, in high school, I ran the 800 mediocrely, and I ran the 4 by 4 and I remember being the anchor in the 4x4 four four races where I would get the baton behind and I'd pass people and crush faces and we'd finish first and it would feel incredible. And I'm like, yeah, and I got it behind. I did it. Very humble of me. <laughs> then I have other times, and I remember this. I'll never forget it because I was pretty proud back then. Um, and uh, I get the baton and we're in the lead. And I take off and I'm running. I just get gassed. And three people pass me right before the finish line. And no one else could be blamed on my team but me. I got the baton in the lead, and I didn't finish well. How we finish matters. Noah could have started the ark, and he could have lost faith in God. He could have quit listening to God. He could have quit obeying God. He could have got distracted by the things of life. He could have got convinced by the wicked people around him that what he was doing was foolish. And the floods would have come nonetheless, because God's faithful to what he says he will do. But Noah finished and now he's in line with many others in the book of Hebrews, this pathway of faith that leads to righteousness and trust. How we finish matters. Verse 11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the seventh day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were open, and rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. On the very same day, Noah and his sons, Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Noah's wife and their wives of his sons with them entered the ark. They and every beast according to its kind, and all the livestock according to their kinds, and every creeping thing, I always read creepy thing, that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature. They went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all the flesh went in there, and of flesh in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female, of all flesh, went in as God commanded them. And the Lord shut him in. The flood continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters. Noah did a good job building his boat. It floated. That's the first problem. He didn't forget the plug. Have you ever done that? <laughs> Drop your boat, forget the plug, water starts coming in. You're just happy it's still on the trailer so you can pull it back out. I've never done that. <laughs> um, and the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep, about 22 feet above the top of the mountains. And all the flesh died that moved on the earth, birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind. Everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life. He blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens. They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were there with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 years. 
days. Wild. Think about that. Noah builds this boat. He's faithful. He completes it. God says in seven days the water's coming. He's hanging out with his family, and it starts dripping on him. It starts raining on him. And some uh, think that maybe they never experienced rain before because of the way the earth was created and sustained back then. There's interesting things about that and, and life and um, honestly, even on like local flood versus global flood, Pastor Ryan and Sean covered it in the podcast. If you want to go back, you can listen to that. It's fascinating stuff. But what do we see here? We see that God shut the door and everything on land with breath died. Welcome to True Up Church. I want us to note first off, God shut the door. Notice Noah didn't create an elaborate system to shut the door. It doesn't say he had a pulley. It didn't say God told him to go in the ark and lock yourself in. God shut the door and shut them in and put them away. And you know what is wild is that God didn't put it on Noah to lock everyone else out. This was God's judgment. God said, Noah, I'm going to give you favor. I'm going to give you grace if you trust and obey me and put your faith in me. And I'm going to put your family away safely for the future that I have for them. But this wicked, evil world that I am judging, I'm going to shut the door. I'm going to keep them out. And I can't help but imagine that as the rain starts coming, because we'll talk about this later, Noah preached while he built. Why are you building this? What are you doing? In the New Testament, it talks about that Noah preached and was a testament to those around him. So the rain starts coming and people were like, oh no, Noah was right. The floods start raising and people run and just imagine the sound of people banging on the ark trying to get in to this boat. God shut the door. And friends, I want to remind us today, as awkward as it is, it can be too late. Friends, we are tempted to focus on how we start and not how we finish and we are tempted to live each day like we have another one. And God says nobody knows their next day. Nobody's promised tomorrow. We wake up each day and we assume it, but his mercies are new each morning when we wake up. Tomorrow isn't promised. And, you know, it's an interesting thing. I just officiated the celebration of life um, for a friend of mine who passed away last October yesterday. And we're looking back, and, and he was older in life, but his passing happened quick over the course of a month or so just deteriorating state. And as we celebrated his life and as we thought about it, I read out of Ecclesiastes this, this text that talks about it's better the day of death than the day of life. It's better to mourn than to feast. And I walked through why those things are true. And it's because mourning and death makes us stop and think about the reality that death is coming for all of us, whether we want it or not. Noah's family survived that judgment, but they still died. God shut the door. It can be too late. Friends, this life is fleeting. It is but a breath. I shared a story um, from high school track, and I remember vividly, like, can't wait to be old enough to graduate high school. And now I'm 40 years old, and my kids are growing up. And you think about how quickly this life goes. And I also have a, a close friend whose father-in-law was mowing the yard on Thursday and had a heart attack and died. Friends, it can be too late. It was too late for those outside the ark to get into the ark when God's judgment came. And the truth is, it can be too late for us. Does this mean of God? No. We see that for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We see that God sent his son and made a way. We see that when God has judgment, he has grace. And again, I want to remind us today that as it can be too late for us, there is a way, and it's in Jesus. It's in the, the faith that we put in Jesus, the hope that we put in Jesus, the life that Jesus came and gave us. God, just like I said for Noah, he has grace and mercy for many, but who will choose him? Who will choose to trust? Who will choose to get in the boat, to get in the Savior? Genesis 8, 1 through 18. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark and God made a wind blow over the earth, and the water subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed. The rain from the heavens was restrained, and the waters receded from the earth continually. At the end of 150 days, the water had abated. And in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountain of Ararat. 
And the waters continued to abate until the tenth month. In the tenth month, on the first day of the month, the top of the mountains were seen. And at the end of 40 days, Noah opened the windows of the ark that he had made. He sent forth a raven. It went to and fro until the waters were dried up from the earth. Then he set forth a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove, 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 the dove, dove, found no place to set her foot. And she returned to him in the ark. For the waters were still in the face of the whole earth. She put, so he put out his hand and took her and brought her back into the ark with him. He waited another seven days and again set forth the dove out of the ark. And the dove came back to him in the evening, and behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. Then he waited another seven days and set forth the dove, and she did not return to him anymore. In the 601st year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried from the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth had dried out. Then God said to Noah, go out from the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out all with you, every living thing that is in, in with you of all flesh, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him, Every beast, every creeping thing, and every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out by families from the ark. Whew. That's a lot of text. So we see this. Do you notice the interesting thing? The creation, the multiply, the go be fruitful and multiply mandate that God gave Adam and Eve, he now gives Noah and his sons. God's reset. He's saying, go as people who trust me. Who believe in me, right? The fall of humanity, Adam and Eve, one of the big issues is that they put their faith in the serpent over God. They obeyed the serpent versus God. Now Noah puts his faith in God and he comes out of the ark with his family. We're going to see later, not in perfection, but in faith and obedience. And God says now, be fruitful and multiply. Multiply a people who trust me, who follow me, who love me. Our final observation from the text is this. Trusting God is more than simply doing nothing. I don't know about you, but at times I'm tempted to just have my faith in Jesus, trust God, but not really live out what trusting God looks like. You know, as a pastor, sometimes I can take for granted um, that I preach and teach and that I do studies and that people are asking me Bible questions, and so it forces me to engage God. But sometimes it feels maybe even more engaging God professionally than it is engaging God personally. This temptation to have my faith be based on what I have to do as a vocational pastor and not have my faith be, I wake up in the morning willing and hungry and wanting to trust God and to do whatever he asked me to do that day. This faith, Noah, said it's more than doing nothing. God shut him in the ark. He floated around for 150 days or, and floated through the, through the floods. And then it says that he started sending birds out. He started using reasoning. He started thinking about it. He started checking and, and using the gifts God gave him, the wisdom God gave him, to figure out what was next and what he should do. But notice, he didn't leave the ark until what? God told him. It says the bird came back. He saw that, the, that there was a life again on the earth, had an olive branch. It says he took the covering off. He peeked his head out. He said, hey, it's aware. Everything's dry. There's life again. It's safe now. But just as he didn't enter the ark until God told him to, he didn't get out of the ark until God told him to. It's this battle and this balance of trusting God and listening for what he has for us to do. But I think sometimes we hear God correctly, but we rush the timing. Or we start doing something and then we ask God to be okay with it. Better to ask for forgiveness than permission, right? I think that's that piece that we see here in this flood. We see that Noah was faithful. He trusted God. He put his faith in God. He did what God commanded. And then God saved the remnant. And God shut the door and put him in there. And it floated. And God did what he said he would do. But then Noah, in obedience and in constant conversation with God, doesn't get out of the ark until it's time. How often do we do things in God's name that God didn't really say to do? 
How many of you today have words and things in your heart that God put in there that God asked you to do that you're waiting and you're pausing to do them? Or today God's saying, hey, that thing that I whispered in your ear to go build, to go invest in, to go do, go do it. That relationship, that life, that gift. Or maybe there's some things today that you guys are hearing God say and he's telling you to stop do, to get out of. You know, Noah could have said, God, it's safe in this ark. We're used to the ark. I mean, it probably smelled bad, and the family tension was probably just, <laughs> I mean, my family just got back from an incredible uh, vacation, and we were with each other for two and a half weeks, and about two, halfway, two-thirds of the way through, my daughter was like, is there anyone else Lincoln can play with that's not me? <laughs> and I'm like, um, we are in Tuscany and don't know anybody, so no, go play with your brother and, and leave me alone. <laughs> And eat more gelato. <clears throat> so gelato was a food group for us on our trip. Pizza, pasta, and gelato. So, But this idea, God, what is God saying get out of? You've been comfortable here. You did what I asked. It's safe again. Here's what I have for you next. Your life isn't in the boat anymore. Get out. Go be fruitful. Go multiply. Go invest. Go do the mandate that I gave you to make this world thrive as a people who have faith in me and live and look different than everywhere else. Now, Noah and his family started off kind of nice because there was no other competition when they entered the boat. But what's our main takeaway? The gospel was for them then and is for us now. Grace was for them then and it is for us now. Because of sin, friends, this is the reality. We live, we die, and we're judged. That was going to be like the main point of my, my message. Just, friends, we live, we die, and we're judged. Go home. <laughs> Again, not to beat a dead horse, God, God will shut the door. It can be too late. It says in Scripture that we are assigned to live, to die, and then to face judgment with God. And this grace goes to anybody who will receive it, but the, but the judgment also goes to anyone who won't receive it. God's grace is big. His love is big. His invitation is gigantic, but will we receive it? We see with Noah that our job is to testify, to share the gospel, to share the faith that we have in Jesus, to share the faith that we have in God. Noah, why are you living so different from everyone else? Why are you building a boat in the desert when it's never rained? Because God, who's God? God's the creator of everything. He's the one you're rebelling against. He said that if we part faith and we trust him, he'll save us. But he is going to judge the sin of the earth. He is going to judge the wickedness. He is going to make his creation right again. As Pastor Ryan said, what do you do when you're a holy, righteous, loving God and you look down at what you made and there's evil in all of it? You create a way. You make a way. And I think today for us, you know, Scripture shows us that while Noah was building the boat, he preached. Our job is to share the gospel, is to share our life, is to preach, is to warn. Their God, their job is to make the decision to put their faith in Jesus. I think we have this tension in our lives that we don't want to share the gospel because what if they don't believe and then we feel guilty for it? That's not our job. It was our job to believe when the gospel was shared with us. Maybe you're in this room and you're wrestling and you're hearing the gospel, you're hearing the reality that there is wickedness in the world and that God will judge it yet again, but there is grace available for you today, for me. Our job is to share, to testify. Their job is to believe. And friends, God's job is to shut the door. Why can we share? Why can we build the boat? Why can we trust and follow God? Because it's God's way. God's the one on the hook. We don't have to judge this world. We can love the people in this world. We can give grace to those around us. You know, the, the celebration of life yesterday for Steve, um, it was interesting hearing the people share uh, their stories of him. And this idea that the kind of person who walks in a room, lights it up, becomes everyone's best friend and is remembered by all before he even leaves the first time. And a room full of people who describe this man that way. But the story that people didn't know was long before that, he had a story of addiction and brokenness and hurt and destroyed relationships, and he encountered Jesus, and he put his faith in Jesus, and his life changed dramatically. And the legacy, the way he finished, left a completely different story than the way he started. 
how we finish matters. Now, friends, we might be tempted to go, well, that's the angry God of the Old Testament. He was, yep, he judged it. It was his right to judge it. I'm not going to argue with that. But, you know, God probably could have fixed things a different way. I don't really follow the angry, mean God of the Old Testament. Um, I follow Jesus. So, to put a bow on this today, we're going to listen to Jesus in Matthew 24. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, mowing the yard, cooking pizza, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Friends, that's Jesus. He's reminding us. In the days of Noah, guys, they thought they had tomorrow. They thought they could repent whenever they wanted to. They thought they didn't need to obey and trust God and put their faith in. They thought they could save themselves. But they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. And today, friends, the call from Jesus is the same. He says, you don't know when the Son of Man is coming back. You don't know when your day is up. You don't know when it's too late to take the salvation and the grace offered through faith. What's our main application today? First one, how are you personally living ready? How are you personally living ready today? You know, obviously, as I write this message and I'm thinking about it all week and I'm processing, I'm going, how am I living my life ready for Jesus to return? Am I living my life ready for Jesus to return? Am I living my life in such a way that if Jesus were to come back, he'd say, well done, good and faithful servant. Am I living my life in such a way that I wake up and want to be with God? That I wake up hungry for God? That I, that I live in a way where I, I need God? Or do I simply just live, claim my faith in Jesus, faith by grace, not by works, so none can boast. But we've seen with Noah, and we've seen through Genesis so far, that faith without works is dead, as James says. Faith that is true faith leads to obedience, and obedience is an action, friends. How are we living personally, living ready? And I think it's this pace and this posture and and I know the joke that we say it often, like we have two ears, one mouth, let's use them proportionally. But how many of us are engaging God on a regular basis, listening, listening, obeying, listening, listening, obeying, listening, listening, obeying? If you're like me, I probably listen to God like my kids listen to me. <laughs> I engage real closely when I want something. I engage real closely when I need something but it's tempting to just let life go and life can go. And again, this is where the memorials and celebrations of life are are blessings to us in the midst of grief. God's faithfulness comes through because these moments where we stop and we reflect and we think about how we are actually living our life. And I think that I like having this one first, how are we personally living ready? Because we can't do the second one uh, if we're not personally walking with Jesus. How are you missionally living awake? How are we personally living ready for Jesus to speak into our lives and to walk with us and to come back? But also, how are we missionally living awake, aware of those around us? When I was in college, there's a book, The Prayer of Jabez. And I remember having it on my windshield and you prayed and it basically was a prayer of mission of, Lord, help me see those around me that I can speak into 
that I can lead, that I can be missional with, that I can engage, that I can share the truth of the gospel with. And I think it's a lot easier for us, or at least it's for me in my life, to share the gospel when I'm walking with Jesus. Well, the question is, why are you living different? Why do you do that different? How do you think different? I'm like, well, it's because of Jesus, because scripture says this, because this is how God leads. It's because I was in my community group and they pointed my eyes off of myself and my problems onto Jesus. It's, it's easier to live missionally when we're living ready personally. And the mission thing is an interesting thing. And um, I don't know, many of you are probably familiar, but there are some magicians uh, named Penn and Teller. And, uh, you know, more sleight of hand, magic isn't real, guys. Um, but Penn is a professing atheist, very staunch atheist, outspoken atheist. And there was an interview uh, years back that I saw. It was like a YouTube clip or something. But he was sharing, and he held up a Bible. And it had a note in it. And he was saying that he was being interviewed, and someone asked him, he said, as an atheist, you know, you have people hand you stuff like this all the time. And he was like, yeah, yeah, I do. I mean, not regularly, but, like, there are plenty of times people hand me Bibles and hand me cards and, and try and, you know, share their Christian faith with me. And the, and the interviewer was like, did, did that make you mad? And catch this, he said, no. You know what would make me mad? Somebody who believes that their loving, righteous God is gonna judge this world eventually, and that if I don't put my faith in Jesus, I'm gonna go to hell forever, to not share that with me. Friends, this is what we believe. We believe that our holy, righteous, just God is going to make all things new and all things right. And as Pastor Ryan shares, we're so tempted sometimes to say, flood the earth, flood them, get rid of the evil. And we fail to, to point it back in us and go, no, no, actually, I'm saying get rid of me. <laughs> Wait, Lord, hold up, hold up, Lord. Just flood the more, the, the worse than me's. Like, I'll point them out for you. <laughs> We testify, we proclaim that no, all the sin and fallen short of the glory of God and that God showed his love in this, that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. And although there's evil and there's brokenness and there's pain in this world, that God is going to take those who will put their faith and trust in him and receive his free gift of grace of the gospel. He's gonna make all things new. And friends, the invitation is for many. And we pray that the response isn't just by few. But he calls us today as believers, will we live ready for him? Will we live awake on mission? Will we testify to the goodness of God in our lives and through our lives? The reality is this life is but a breath. It's short. Eternity is long. God is faithful. And this morning, friends, whether you've trusted Jesus for a long time or you've trusted Jesus for a short time, the choice is yours. Who will you put your faith in? What will you put your hope in? Where will you put your trust? And will we obey? Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you that you are faithful, that you are good, that you are righteous, that you are holy. And Lord, I pray that as we wrestle with texts like this, we wrestle with the reality of what you say, we wrestle with the wickedness in the world and the sin in our hearts, but also the grace that you offer and give and provide. Lord, that you didn't sit back and do nothing, but that you made a way. You died so we could live. And Lord, I pray that we put our hope in that. We put our trust in you and that our lives would bear the fruit of that. In your name we pray.